We'll get straight into it. If you've got a Bible there, can you turn to Luke chapter 19 for me this morning? How many of you have noticed that culture is changing? Anyone pick that up? Last handful of years? Anyone, anyone picked up in the last six months? Kind of, it feels like it's, feels like about probably, you know, five or six years ago, we, we well, probably 10 years ago, there were these gentle breezes of a change and shifting culture, and then they kind of stayed like this gentle breeze for a number of years. About four years ago, probably picked up and got out of first gear into second, but it was still kind of cruising at a low speed. Probably in about the last six months, it's felt like it's, it's gone straight from second gear into fifth and is just heading and charging down a highway in a certain direction at a very, very quick uh, pace. And sometimes I think uh, we can do one of a couple of things. One thing is we can just sit back and, and look at culture and go, well, culture is what culture is and we can't change it and we'll just uh, you know, do what we do here and we'll protect our space and, and so on. Uh, or we can, we can look at culture and what goes on in the world around us and ask ourselves the question, is there an opportunity within the space of what's happening within culture for the church to shine? Is there an opportunity for us to stand up and show something that maybe we haven't shown as well in the past? Or maybe an opportunity to show something that might not have been noticed as much in the past, but going forward it might really be accentuated to the world around us, something good about the church. I go back and I think about um, the early church and... Uh, yeah, there were some practices in the early days in ancient times um, and different periods in ancient uh, history where things would happen. For example, a plague, uh, I think at one point, came through Rome. And uh, the children and that, that got sick were just left out in the streets to die. And it was at that moment that the church, for whatever reason, I don't have anything I've read document as to the thought process behind it, other than they realize these children and these people that are sick, they're still loved by God, made in the image of God and important. So they went out in the streets and they grabbed them and they took them in and they cared for them. Sometimes that expense themselves of catching whatever that disease was. Uh, it was a moment where something was happening in, in culture, happening in the world around them. And, you know, the, the church had always cared for the sick and always cared for, for, for those. It was, it's been part of our DNA from the very beginning. Uh, little bits and pieces, it's grown. We wouldn't have hospitals if it wasn't for Christians. Christ followers were the ones that started public hospitals. Christ followers were the ones that made education a public thing and said every person, not just the rich but the poor, have a right to be educated. It was Christ followers that started uh, education. It was, if you go back and look at history, Christ followers, uh, most of your social welfare type things that happen and exist in the world right now are started by Christ followers. People that, that had a, a, a worldview that were shaped by the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of these ancient documents, the Word of God, the Bible, whatever you want to call it. And because of that worldview, they acted and lived out a certain way in response to that, and that reflected something to the world around them of the goodness and the reality of God. And I've been thinking about this recently, and I'm wondering whether we're not coming to a place where maybe we have an opportunity again as a church to shine something to the rest of the world that's getting lost um, that's getting buried, that maybe, just maybe, we are at a cultural moment where we uh, need to have a bit of a look at ourselves as individuals and the way we relate to people. Maybe as congregations, as churches, we need to sit back and have a look at ourselves. And maybe there's an opportunity for us to display something that I believe Jesus displayed 2,000 years ago as he walked planet Earth and went from village to village teaching, preaching, reaching out, loving, healing, Casting out demons, all the stuff that he did. And I want to have a little bit of a look at that this morning. Uh, I've talked about this a bit before, but it's just on my heart more and more the last few weeks that it's not just a good teaching, but I really think there's something of, uh, uh, something of God in this for this particular time that we're in. Um, I came across this um, thing on, what are, those, what are the online things? You, you know where they put, I'm not good with online. Like I know Facebook and I know there's one called Twitter. Um, yeah, that... Um, but there's, a, there's, there's a Pinterest, Pinterest, that's it, Pinterest. I, I, I saw this thing on, anyone know what Pinterest is? I actually don't, I just know it was on Pinterest, so you can explain what it is to me later. But I saw this thing on Pinterest, and it's, it said this, it said, Dear boyfriend, next time you make a joke about women belonging in the kitchen, just remember that that's where all the knives are kept. <laughs> just remember that's where all the knives are kept. Belonging. My uncle Jeff, I remember one time my uncle, and you've probably all heard this at different times about the church. Uh, I remember one time inviting my uncle Jeff to come along to church uh, with me when we were in the GSAC. And he made this statement to me. He said, if I walked into that place, the 
roof would cave in. Anyone ever heard that before from someone? If I walked into the doors of a church, why the roof would cave in? Well, I was able to say to him, well, we've actually got steel reinforced structures. You're pretty safe. You know, no matter what your life's like, I'm pretty sure the roof ain't going to cave in here. But what he was saying was what everybody's saying that says that, I don't belong there. I don't belong there. That's not my place. I don't belong in the church. I'm a, I don't believe that. I'm, I'm, I live this way. I don't adhere to your values, your morals, whatever. The Jesus stories like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Uh, I, I don't belong in that place with you people. In Luke chapter 19, we have this story. It's an interesting story, and I love the story of Zacchaeus. Anyone like the story of Zacchaeus? Yep. Zacchaeus, pick it up in verse 1. It says that Jesus entered Jericho, and he was passing through. So Jesus had no intention of staying there. He was passing through Jericho. He was on his way somewhere. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. If you read the book of Luke... There's, not a lot of, there's a lot of mention of Jesus uh, uh, reaching out to people. There's a lot of mention of uh, uh, reaching the lost. This is where we get a lot of our parables, the lost coin, the lost son. There's this, if, if you read the book of Luke, Luke's uh, uh, description of the life and ministry of Jesus, you see very clearly that Luke has these categorizations, doesn't he? He kind of has lost and found. He puts everybody into these two categories. The Pharisees saw prostitute and drunkard and tax collector and all that. But, but, but Luke kind of paints this picture of Jesus saying, no, no, there was lost and there was found. There were those that were with God and then there were those that were not with God. And so here we have this story with Zacchaeus and he says that he was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. Now, for those of you that don't know, he was wealthy because he was a chief tax collector. So the tax collectors went out there and, and they, I'm not going to say anything about tax collectors today, but what they did back then was they definitely took more than what they were entitled to take when they pilfered taxes. Now Zacchaeus is in a difficult situation here because Zacchaeus is actually a Jew. But what he's doing is he's working for the Romans. The Romans are the oppressors of the Jews, so to speak, in this day. Although the Jews had a lot of freedom, they were still under the Romans. The Romans were still in authority. So here's this Jew who's being oppressed by the Romans but So the Romans don't like him because he's a Jew. But he's working for them and extorting money out of his own people. So his own people don't really like him either. He's a man that doesn't belong in the Roman world. And really, by virtue of his vocation, he doesn't really belong in the Jewish world either. He's a guy that doesn't really have much of a place to belong at all, actually. It says in verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately, I must stay at your house today. Awesome evangelism strategy. He just says, I'm going to come and stay at your house, Zacchaeus. Didn't ask, could he? Just, Zacchaeus, come down, get out of the tree, I'm coming to your house today. Don't try it, it probably won't work for you, you're not Jesus, but it worked for him. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So all the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. Wow. This is not the same guy that climbed the tree. This is a different guy now than the one that climbed up the tree in the beginning. He says, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything... I'm sure at that point he had a sly grin on his face because he knew he cheated a lot of people out of a lot of things. And I think he knew Jesus knew that too. There's a bit of humor here maybe. He says, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came, and we all know this because we hear it a lot, to what? To seek and to save the lost. So here's the case. He's not the most respected member of the community. And it says that he heard Jesus was passing by, so he comes running out to see Jesus. Problem is, the case is short. So Zacchaeus can't see Jesus because everybody that came to see Jesus is actually stopping Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus. There's a, there's a message in itself, isn't it, really? Those that came to see Jesus were the very reason why Zacchaeus couldn't actually see Jesus properly. So Jesus does something pretty wild and he invites himself to come to Zacchaeus' place for dinner. And of course, this prompts a not-so-nice response from the crowds. They say, Jesus has gone to be the guest of a sinner. They weren't saying that 
just as a matter of fact, oh, he's just going to hang out with Zacchaeus. They were saying it in a derogatory way. This guy who's supposed to be holy and supposed to be God on earth and supposed to be sent of God is going and hanging out with the kind of person that you don't hang out with. He's going to be in a place where you don't go. Good Christians don't go there. Remember the old, olden, day, well, olden days for some of you? I'm looking over here more. It's almost like demographic, isn't it? You're with the young people. Well done. But the old days, remember you don't, you, what is it? You don't dance, you don't, don't drink, dance and chew or go with people who do or something. What was the old saying years ago? You can't do any of those things. You don't hang out in those kinds of places. <laughs> Hate to break it to you, Rod. Um, now, this was not the only time that Jesus copped this kind of criticism, right? Go back a little bit, Luke 15, 1. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. They all came. There was something about Jesus, wasn't there? These people came to hear him, to be near him, to be around him, to be in his presence. It says, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, here they go again. They muttered, they said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Again, this is not being said as a, a, hey, this is wonderful. Look at what he's doing. He's caring for these people. He's accepting these people. It's not being said like that. It's being said again in a very derogatory fashion. This guy is attracting the wrong people, hanging out with the wrong people. You see, Jesus seemed to be a magnet that according to the religious leaders of his day, he attracted the wrong crowd, didn't he? He just seemed to attract the wrong crowd types of people, according to the religious leaders of his day. About 2010, uh, I was we were, um, pastoring a long time, a while back, we were pastoring another church, and I came across an article in, anyone remember the Bulletin magazine? Anyone remember Bulletin magazine? Yep, over here I'm saying that because you probably will. Over here, anyone remember magazines? Yeah, okay. Anyone remember paper? Um, so I came across an article in the Bulletin magazine in 2010, <coughs> And basically, it was a three or four page massive article talking about the church. And it was talking about the, the influence of Pentecostal churches. We, we, there were, it, was, it was highlighting some of the mega churches in our country, the hill songs and things like that. And it was talking about the, 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 the inroads that the church was making into politics and into education and into these different spheres and realms of society. A lot of the story was things taken out of context, which when you listen to the secular media, usually when they talk about the church, Quite often, it's things taken out of context. So a lot of the article was out of context, but there was something that grabbed me, a statement that was made that kind of was imprinted on me, and I've never been able to forget this statement. This was a statement. It said, Pentecostal churches have this philosophy of behave, believe, belong. Pentecostal churches have this philosophy of behave, believe, belong. In other words, if you behave like us, if you behave like us, so you, you look like us, you behave the way that we do, maybe you dress like us, maybe you, you, you talk like us, if you look and behave like one of us, and if you then believe what we believe, then maybe we'll let you belong with us. If you behave like us, and you believe what we believe, if you meet those two criteria, then we will allow you to belong to our group. Pentecostal churches have this behave, believe, belong philosophy. I remember many years ago, we were living in Bundaberg, and um, I, I, we went to this little Presbyterian church up there, beautiful pastor, beautiful church. But I remember one Sunday morning being there, and the way they used to do uh, communion was you would come on up. Uh, was, was that? The, hey? Yes, Ang Ang Anglican, sorry, not Presbyterian, Anglican. And you were coming up the front, take communion and so on. Anyway, I remember one Sunday sitting there uh, in church and I turned around and I looked up the back and these two Islander boys walked in the back of the church. Um, one of them, you would know his name. I'm not going to say his name, but he ended up playing rugby league for the Broncos, rugby league for Australia and rugby union for Australia. And he just arrived here from his overseas island nation and the Broncos had sent him up to Bundaberg to sell vacuum cleaners. So when they got here in order to, to uh, raise some income before training started, they were working, selling vacuum cleaners. So he found himself in Bundaberg selling vacuum cleaners. He went out Saturday night and had a big bend, a big night out with his mates. Early hours of Sunday morning, about five o'clock, he told me the story. He said, I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw my big island mother lean forward and put her face to mine and point a finger at me and said, you better go to church. I woke up in a sweat, jumped out of bed, and he said, I took off, and this was the first place I could find. And he found himself in church that Sunday morning. But what was really interesting is before I went up the back and had this conversation with him, I observed as soon as he walked in. 
And a gentleman, lovely guy, well-meaning, nothing wrong with what he, meant, what, what he was trying to do, he walked straight up to him with a book and placed a book in his hand and then turned to this page and said, now say that, now say this, now go and sit there, now when they tell you, you stand. And he went through all the behaviour that you have to do in this service if you don't want to stand or if you want to fit in. Now after all that happened at the end of the service, that's when I went up to him and I had a bit of a chat with him and he shared with me his story. And it was interesting, here's a guy sitting in church that looked like he was one of us. He, he stood at the right time, sat at the right time, turned to the right page, said the right thing. He looked like he was one of us. But as I chatted with him and talked to him, he had no relationship with God whatsoever. But he looked the part. He looked the part. And when he walked in the door, the first thing that he was told was, here's how you're going to behave this morning while you're with us. The truth is he had no relationship with God, but after being told what to do, he looked like he had a relationship with God. Because he was going through the right motions, doing the right things. There's a behavioural scientist many years ago called uh, A.H. Maslow. Anyone that's done any university or potentially high school would have heard of Abraham Maslow. And uh, he came up with this thing called a hierarchy of needs. Most of you would have heard of... He was a behavioural scientist and he studied a whole bunch of people and after studying all these people, he came to this conclusion where he drafted this thing uh, about human beings that he believed were these, these levels of needs that humans have that need to be met on our way to becoming all that we're meant to be so we can do all that we're meant to do. Uh, And it's interestingly too, by the way, a lot of people don't know this, but he didn't study what we would consider today down and out type people. The people that he studied for his hierarchy of needs were well-adjusted, well-to-do people. So when I explain this to you, he didn't look for people that were struggling and down. Uh, He went to -to well-adjusted, well-to-do people and he came up with what he called his hierarchy of needs. He came up with five basic needs. Um, It's been taken further now by other um, uh, people who study behavioural science. That was about seven to nine different levels. But Maslow came up with these five needs. Now the interesting thing is that he believed that you cannot move on to the next level until you had met the first level in a person's life. And these were the five levels in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Level one (coughs) was psychological needs. That's the need for food, for water, warmth, sleep, etc. The basic stuff of life. Hopefully, most people find that stuff in the family. The second level was the need for safety. Security from danger, threat, deprivation, a roof over your head, that kind of stuff. Again, those first two needs are things that hopefully in a perfect world are being met in a person's life in the context of a family. The third need was the need to belong. And that was to be loved, to experience love, friendship, to be part of a team, uh, to have social activities, have things to participate in with other human beings, somewhere that you fit, somewhere that you fit. The fourth one was self-esteem. And he explained that as self-respect and respect for others, personal development, and our talents are being fully uh, uh, self-respect, self for others, achieving something with your life. So achieving something with your life. The fifth level was self-actualization. That was personal growth, personal development. Our talents are fully utilized. Creativity is harnessed, and we become everything we were created to be. These five levels of need that he came across. Interestingly enough, Maslow himself said, most people will never get past level three. Level three is what? It's the need to belong. He said most people will never get past level three. In other words, most people are going to get through level one and two, and then they're going to spend a majority of their life trying to find a place where they actually feel like they belong. Isn't it interesting? They're going to spend time trying to find a place where they belong. There's a deep need in everybody to find a place where we belong. It's actually a major driver in human behavior and pushes a lot of people to do some of the things they do, whether they want to do them or not. There's this underlying desire to belong somewhere. If you've walked into this place at some point on your journey, and all of you have, I hope, I hope and pray that you stuck partly because you feel like you found somewhere where you belong. I hope when you walked in here, you felt like you belonged in this place. It was okay for you to be here, not some other version of you. I hope when you walk in here and the more you've walked in here, the more you've realized that, that maybe at first you wore a mask and then maybe uh, uh, after a while you left the mask at the front door, then maybe after a while you left it in the car in the car park, then maybe after a while you left it on the bedside, then maybe after a while you don't even bother getting it out of the drawer anymore because you know 
that you belong in a place like this. You know that you belong in the presence of Christ followers and you know that you belong in the presence of Jesus. The real you belongs in the presence of Jesus. When I was younger, there was this kid and uh, I think I've shared this story before. We used to call him the Purple Pansy. It's a very derogatory name. This is, this is many, many years ago when I was living in Sydney. This kid used to dress in purple all the time and his mother used to send him to the shops. So he would walk past the front of my house, this big paddock where me and all my mates played. And every time he would walk past the paddock to go to get the milk or something, we would drop our football, run across the park road and we would taunt this kid and push him and call him names. Eventually, he realized if I don't say nothing back or respond, if I just stare blankly forward and keep walking, these guys will leave me alone. When we realized that's what he was doing, we just kept upping the ante to the next level, to the next level. Until eventually, I have this strong memory in my mind one day, walking along, and here's this kid, and there's about five or six of us, bullies. This boy was a big boy, by the way, by himself. He probably could have gone ape on us and crushed us all, but he didn't. He was scared, he was intimidated, feeling very insecure, For whatever reason, I don't know his story. I wish I did know his story. I wish I could bump into him and apologize. That's what I wish. And I remember one day walking alongside him. We're taunting him and he's not saying nothing. And I remember just in a moment reaching up and planting a punch on this guy's cheek. And he barely flinched. He kept walking. And I remember seeing tears. His facial expression didn't change. But I saw tears coming down this kid's eyes. But I remember at that moment seeing those tears seeing my mates around me cheering me on, thinking I was something awesome. And I remember inside my heart breaking and having this conversation with myself saying, Alan, that's not you. You don't do that. So I was always a soft-hearted, nice kid. But I hung out with guys uh, because I didn't feel like I belonged. My family environment wasn't great and it didn't feel like a great place of belonging in there. So I went looking for belonging somewhere else and I found it with a bunch of guys that, that, that accepted me, not for who I was, but accepted me because I did whatever I had to do in order to belong in that group of people. And if that meant being an idiot and going against my own values, my own character, I did it. That's how strong this sense of belonging is. We have a word for it. We call it peer pressure. We talk about peer pressure. Peer pressure is simply the desire uh, to, to want to belong, to fit in, to do whatever it takes to find a place where you can have that third level of need met, that need of belonging somewhere. It's a strong driver. It's the reason why in America today, there are 16-year-old kids, 13-year-old kids who are going to join street gangs and put on colours and do hand signs, knowing statistically they'll be dead by the age of 18. They know that because their cousins have been killed, their brothers, their sisters, whatever. They know about it because it's advertised, it's talked about. They're educated to the hilt about it. They know it, but they're going to do it anyway because that's how strong the desire is to belong somewhere. We do things... Sometimes things we don't want to do because we have this strong desire as human beings to want to belong. And we're called to belong in the presence of God. In the beginning, we belonged in a place called the Garden of Eden in the presence of God. And ever since we were booted from the garden, ever since we were removed from the garden, there's been this desire to get back to the true place of true belonging, which is the presence of God. But for people that don't know God, they'll try to find it anywhere they can. This desire to want to belong somewhere. Now, as a church, if we operate on this same level of behave, believe, belong, I want to tell you three problems that we have as a church. And I want to talk to us today as a congregation. I want to talk to us as individuals as well in your own world and your own life. Because it's not just groups that have this kind of mentality. It can be individuals too. Behave like I behave, believe what I believe, and I'll allow you to belong in my social network. I'll allow you to belong in my church. I'll allow you to belong in my little group. And three problems with behave, believe, belong mentality. Number one, it's pride. Because we think that we behave better than the way other people behave. We fall into this trap of thinking the way we behave is the right way to behave, and if you don't behave like us, then you must be wrong, because we're right, because this is how you behave. I remember many years ago, a pastor in a church when we were living in Brisbane and we were ministering with different churches, and this pastor put me in his car one day and we were driving to his church, and on the way we drove past another church. And I didn't know anything about denominations like I do now back in those days, but I remember this pastor as we drove, he pointed to a church, a rather, rather large church on the north of Brisbane, he pointed to the church and he said to me, you don't ever want to go over there, don't ever hang out with those people, they drink alcohol and they go to parties and they drink wine, and he just listed all these behaviours and I didn't know anything about anything, so I just went, oh, okay, no worries, thinking you're a pastor, you would know, I guess, you know. 
What was he saying? He was saying, don't hang out with them because they don't behave like we behave. Because the group he belonged to, you don't drink wine, you didn't drink this, you didn't go to a party, you didn't have loud music above three. You'd, like, that's the way his behaviour was, that was his thing. And so if you don't behave like that, then you're not quite as good as we are. And behaviourally belong can create an environment of pride amongst a group of people or even amongst an individual. Second thing, problem that it can cause is secret sins. People go underground with the real them. Why? Because they don't want to get kicked out. They want to belong. What will you think of me if you see the real me? What would you say if you knew I struggled with this thing? What would I lose if I came out and said I'm blah? And so people go underground with stuff in their life, don't want to talk about it, don't want to go to those places because it will cost them too much. And what's the too much? It'll cost me the place where I'm belonging. It'll cost me the place where I am right now. If you only knew the real me, you wouldn't let me hang around you. Just like me in Claymore in Sydney with those boys. If I didn't carry on like that, I know what would have happened. They would have said, you're soft, I'll get out of our group. It would have cost me my place of belonging. So that little broken heart, as I'm watching the tears stream that boy's face, I never told a single soul about that. I didn't talk to any of those boys. I wouldn't dare because I'd be gone and I wouldn't be allowed to belong anymore. I had a, a friend of mine when we were in YWAM many, many years ago and I remember she came to me one day and she said to me, there's this young boy in her church in America who had taken his own life. And we had a conversation about the issues around that. She said, you know, no one can work it out because this guy was, did evangelism every Friday night. He was leading youth group. He was a, a, a youth leader, Bible study leader. He looked like the most on fire kid in the world. 12 months later, almost to the day, I saw her in the, in the kitchen area again and she's down and I'm having a chat with her. What's going on? She said, you're not going to believe it. Another guy in, the, in our church has gone ahead and done the same thing. And she said, it's just weird. Because if you were to pick who might do that, they were definitely not the people. That, he was not the one. Again, he, he, he ticked all the boxes. He looked like he was the most on fire person for Jesus. And I'm not saying I have an answer to that question or another reason why I don't. But what I do know is this. The picture she painted of him being so on fire, and all the, that, that wasn't the whole picture. There was something else going on. There was something else going on. And I don't know that church, so I would never make a judgment call, but I really do hope that there was an environment created there where, 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 where if he wanted to, if he chose to, because not everyone's going to, but if he wanted to, he would have felt safe to be able to bring that stuff out and talk about that stuff. One of the reasons why people don't want to is because the power to want to belong somewhere is so strong, we don't want to jeopardize the opportunity to belong by being real and honest about who we are. We're talking about the dirty messes in our world. Which leads to the third problem. It leads to false discipleship. It leads to false discipleship. It creates false Jesus apprenticeship programs. I'll behave and believe simply because I want so badly to belong. I'm behaving and believing not because that's my real behavior, not because I actually believe this stuff. I just want to belong. Well, you know what? God gets to the heart of us, doesn't he? God gets right down there in the nitty-gritty of what's really going on in our world. God accepts us warts and all, and he wants to get down there with the warts and with the all and process and, and, and do what he does and, and bring true healing and true wholeness to us. Not just, he doesn't just want us to look good. He wants us to be good. God doesn't want us to just look the part on the outside. It doesn't impress God. It impresses people. It might open doors for you. It might get you opportunities, but it doesn't impress God because God sees the heart of us. And it's the heart that God wants to play around in. It's the heart that God wants to get involved in. But when we have this, this false picture of what discipleship looks like, if we think discipleship just means looking a certain way and believing a certain set of doctrines, then we're right with Christ and we're, we're going good just so we can belong, we're missing it. We're missing what true apprenticeship as a Christ follower looks like. How many know that God changes us from the inside out, not the outside in? This is what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, they behaved the way that religious people should behave, and they had all the doctrines down pat that religious people should have. Yet Jesus said to them, you know what, here's your problem. The outside of the cup looks all squeaky clean, but the inside is full of muck and rubbish. He says, what you should have done 
You spend a bit of time focusing on the inside of the cup. Let's clean that first. Let's clean the inside of the cup. That's what apprenticeship as a Jesus follower is. It's about allowing God to get into those places. But we'll never allow God to get into those places if we pretend those places don't exist just so that everybody will like us or just so that we can belong. See, Jesus actually did ministry the complete opposite, didn't he? That article said the Pentecostal church has this behave, believe, belong mentality. Jesus flipped the whole thing around and he had a belong, believe, behave. The first thing Jesus did is he made people feel like they belonged with him, didn't he? People just, there was something magnetic about Jesus that people that, that didn't belong to the religious world felt like they could be in the presence of Jesus. They could come to him. When he would go from village to village, it says crowds gathered. Now, these crowds were not all people coming out of church on a Sunday morning. These were people coming out of the pubs, coming out of the prostitution dens. These were people coming out of all kinds of muck and yuck, and they just wanted to be with Jesus. There was something about the presence of Jesus, this holy, perfect Son of God, that those kinds of people still felt like, in the midst of his holiness and perfection, they still felt like they belonged and had a right to be there. They felt like they belonged in his presence. And so they came to Jesus. Here's here's the way I think it should work in the context of church life, and here's the way that I think Jesus did it. I think that our job is to create an environment of belonging. That's what we do. If, if we as a congregation or as individuals can create in our world and in our church an environment where those kinds of people feel like they belong, they feel like they belong in that environment, it's okay to be in that environment. It doesn't mean unconditional love does not mean unconditional acceptance. We all know that, don't we? The woman uh, caught in adultery, that whole story displays that. That, that, that Jesus did not judge her whatsoever. Matter of fact, he, he, he cast a bit of judgment on the people that were judging her. They drop their stones. They all take off. Remember the story? But he then turns to her and he says, you know what? I unconditionally love you, but go and sin no more. I unconditionally love you as a person, but it doesn't mean I unconditionally accept everything you do. You're a work in progress. And Jesus was very clear on several occasions with people. I love you. You're accepted. Uh, but I want your behavior. I want you to go away and think better. I want you to go away and, and, and now that you have this, this uh, reality of me in your life, this reality of, of the love of God, the acceptance of God and who God is, I want you to allow that to permeate you and, and, and get involved in your ethics and your values and the way you think and the way you do life and allow that to transform you. So our job is to create a belonging environment. Now here's what I believe in church. If we create a belonging environment, people will keep coming back. Somebody will walk in here that doesn't behave like us, doesn't believe like us, but if they feel like they belong, they'll come back next week. That's what I believe. They'll come back. Now, here's what happens. We create a belonging environment. The second thing is the Word of God is what challenges people's belief. It's the Word of God that challenges people's belief. That Word, when I read it, God seems to think a lot differently about things than I do. God seems to have a logic that's different to the kind of human logic I have. God has a way of seeing the world that's not tainted by my background, my culture, my education, my experiences. God has a way of seeing the world that's not tainted by any of that. It's pure and clear. And so if people feel like they belong, they come back. If they come back, guess what? They're going to be exposed to the Word of God. It's the Word of God that will shape belief. It's the Word of God that begins to shape belief. And here's the thing. It's the Holy Spirit that helps with behavior. It's the Holy Spirit that helps with behavior. You cannot live a perfect life. You cannot become the person you want to become just because of your own self-willpower. Jesus said, uh, uh, you go back to Ezekiel chapter 36, I think it's verse 26, 27. Ezekiel, speaking of when the Holy Spirit comes, he said this. He said that, that, oh, I'll take out your heart of stone, I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll take out your dead spirit, I'll give you a new spirit, and I'll place my spirit inside of you, and I will cause you to walk in my ways. In other words, the spirit inside of me is going to propel me to go a certain direction in life, which is why if you are a believer in this place and you choose to do wrong, you've got something inside of you that you know is pushing you another direction. Now, you can disobey that. That's, that's your choice because it's not possession. It's not going to make you do it. But you know deep down there's something inside of you called the Holy Spirit going, you can do that, but I'm telling you, I'm trying to gently nudge you this way because this is the way walk in it. So our job is to create environments where people feel like they belong. And if they feel like they belong, they'll be exposed to the Word of God. The Word of God will challenge belief. And when the Word of God gets in, the Holy Spirit begins to work on behavior. 
Jesus flipped the whole thing on its end from the way this article talks about modern day Pentecostalism. You know what ended up happening there with Zacchaeus in that story? He repented. Here's this guy. The Jews don't like me. The Romans don't like me. Here's the son of God. He wants to come and stay in my house. We don't know the whole conversation. We don't know everything that happened. What we do know is this. At the end of that time that Zacchaeus turns around, it looks like just of his own volition, and says, Jesus, I repent. I'm, I'm turning my life around. I'm making wrongs right, and I'm going in a different direction. That's the power of the belonging of Jesus. It's the power of the presence of God. It's the power of people knowing that God accepts them this side of the fence, not when they get on that side of the fence. But he accepts them right now. See, people didn't have to believe in Jesus in order to get his acceptance. They believed in Jesus because of his acceptance. Because he accepted them. Because he loved them, warts and all. Whether they believed what he believed, behaved like he behaved, they were created and made in the image of God and everybody has a little bit of God DNA, the fingerprint of God, and everybody has eternally in their heart. There's something there to work with. There's something there to work with. Behave, believe, belong creates an environment where you need to look good. Belong, believe, behave creates an environment where you're actually empowered to become good. You change. People change. Now, here's the thing. I think we've got an opportunity right now in this cultural season we're in to show something that the world is unable to display. And that is belong, believe, behave. Anyone been watching the news lately? Uh, Andrew Thornburn, the CEO of, uh, was it Essendon? Football club came out that he was a Christian and so on. And bottom line, his tenure lasted 24 hours and he resigned. There's no room for somebody like him in that environment, apparently. Apparently, Christians are slowly more and more unable to belong in the corporate world or can't belong in the business world or can't belong in this space or can't belong in that space. Or if you think this way, you can't. We live in such a fragmented society, don't we? And, and, and social media is trying to push everybody, conform everybody with a cookie cutter. Think this way, look this way, act this way, and then you'll belong to this big group of people who are angry at the world, don't believe in God, uh, you know, angry at this and fighting for this and, fight, and, and so on. And if you stray from the narrative a little bit, well, you're ousted, you don't belong anymore. Yeah, the church is slowly going to become one of the only places where we'll let you belong first, regardless of what you, how you behave or what you believe. Because you matter to God because you matter to God. And we're not here fighting for our doctrines. And this is where we need to be careful because doctrine is getting shifted and changed and the boundaries are moving. And let me tell you something, I'm the first one to say I will not stray from what I believe this says about life, about sexuality, about eternity, about family. I'm not going to stray from that. I believe it, right? But I don't want to fight so aggressively to straighten out a doctrine to the point where I lose people because I don't love them. Because loving those people is more important right now. Jesus had this amazing capacity to show acceptance and make people feel like they belonged even though he never compromised on his teaching. He must have been an amazing, amazing man didn't compromise on what he believed, yet those people still felt the love and felt like they belonged with this man. And I just wonder today in the world we're in, as a church, are we displaying that same kind of attitude to the world around us? You know, I had a guy two weeks ago, I was down at football training and end of training, he made some comment about, oh, just pray to God, Alan, we'll be right. And I flared up at him I turned around I said don't you keep mocking my religion mate I got a bit angry at him I meant every word I said and I won't back down from what I said but I came home and I said to Jackie I don't I don't have a problem with what I said but I'm questioning the motivation of where it came from it came from anger it came from defending my theology my doctrine and there was nothing in my heart of love toward that man and his position at that point. This guy doesn't know Jesus. I don't even know his story, really. I just know he's had a wife, a breakdown, another woman. And, but I don't know much else about him. I thought, Jesus, I don't want to be like that. 
I'm going to stand on right doctrine. I'm going to fight for right doctrine, but I'm going to find a way to fight and stand for it in a way that doesn't push people away and alienate them and say, you don't belong here. No, no, you belong here. You belong in the presence of God. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That includes every sinner on planet earth right now, you may include. So what kind of environment do we want to create here? What kind of environment do you create in your own family? What kind of environment? I mean, this can go to the way we treat our own kids, the way we treat our neighbours, the way we treat our family. See, religion's about behave, believe, belong. Religion's more concerned with the outward performance than the state of the heart. And religion's more focused on whether you dotted your I's and crossed your T's than whatever might have been in your life that stopped you from doing it. And if I harp on too much about dotting I's and crossing T's, I'll probably never create an environment where I'll get to see what's in your heart that stopped you doing it anyway. I think we have a moment right now in the world that we live in where we can display something of God that the world is unable to combat right now. And that is a place where people belong regardless of how they think, regardless of what they believe, and regardless of how they behave. It's not going to change what we do here. We're still going to preach the word of God. We're still going to live our life according to what we believe is right. But we're going to allow them to get close enough to feel the impact of that and let people know that they belong. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, this messed up, crazy, upside down world, he so loved it that he gave his one and only son. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, messed up and twisted in our beliefs and twist. And by the way, the world is messed up and weird now, but don't kid ourselves. It was messed up and weird in Jesus' time and he was facing people uh, with similar stuff going on to what we're facing right now. It just seems so weird now because we've had so many years without having to confront and face this kind of stuff because of our Judeo-Christian worldview in our nation. Now that's being ripped up, so now we're facing things that Jesus would have faced back in his day and other nations have faced. We're afraid, maybe, that by accepting people as they are, it'll be interpreted as accepting everything they do. But hey, Jesus did it anyway, didn't he? Jesus did it anyway. And my hope and prayer for us is that in this season, this time that we're in, that each of us go to the Lord and we say, God, I need the Holy Spirit's help to not compromise on what is right and to not teach things that are not right. See, I don't ever think that Jesus hung out with tax gatherers and sinners just so they felt good about their sin because, oh, God will come, God will be with you while you sin and get drunk and everything. That party's with you. Oh, no. If you're reading that, you're not reading it in the Bible. What Jesus wanted them to know was that as you are, you are able to come to God. The old saying, you don't clean the fish before you catch it. You catch the fish first. And then you do what you do. And my, my prayer, my prayer for us and for every church is that in this moment that we get a bit of wisdom from God, each of us, God, we are not going to compromise on what's right, but at the same time, Lord, we are going to have to create environments where people feel like they belong because they're only going to belong out there in their group until they say one wrong statement or put up one wrong Twitter feed or say one wrong thing on Facebook or stand up and go, I don't agree or say, look, that's gone too far, I can't. As soon as they do that, they are punted and they are out and they're going to be looking for another place to belong. And I hope and pray that they can find that in the church. Amen? Amen? Lord, thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for, uh, God, it, there's so much about you, Lord, that we do not understand. God, there's so much about you. Lord, we just wish, 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 wish that it was black and white. And some things appear black and white, but there's a lot of grey things in there too that we just don't get. But Lord, we can only live out of the revelation we have and live out of what we do. Understand. But Father, I, I, I pray for a rise church. I pray. Lord, that we would be a place, Lord, where the tax gatherers and the sinners of this world would feel like they belong. Lord, this would be a place where they would come and feel accepted. They would come and feel love. They would come and build relationships, Lord, that this would be a place where if they keep coming, they're going to hear the word of God, that the word of God would chip away. The word of God would give them another way to think. And that the Holy Spirit 
would get on the inside and chip away and help them, empower them, Lord, to change their behavior. Sin is sin because that's what they do. Lord, bottom line, there go I, but for the grace of God. I don't know what my life would be like today if I did not have the Holy Spirit in me, if I did not have the grace of God upon my life, if I did not have the community of the church around me. I don't know what my world would look like, Lord. And Father, let that be the testimony of many, many other people that come into this place, Lord. And Lord, in our hearts, Father, if we are, if there are things in our hearts, God, that are stopping us from creating that place of belonging, I just pray, Holy Spirit, speak to us, show us. Reveal those things to us, God. And give us the strength and the courage to be a part of what I believe you want to do in this season, Father. God, is the world saying you're not good enough, you said the wrong thing, you acted the wrong way, you don't look the right part, get out that the church would open its arms and go, you know what, but you belong here, so come on in. And Lord, in the next seven days as we leave this place, Father, give each and every one of us an opportunity to tell somebody about you, God. Somebody right now, this morning, doesn't understand their value, their worth, doesn't understand that Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago so they could have a relationship with the creator of the world. Give us a chance to tell those people in the next seven days we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless you guys.